Come on, let's welcome the presence of the Lord here this morning. Hallelujah. We praise you today, dear God. We thank you, Lord, for today's service, dear God. We thank you for the opportunity to come into your house. Hallelujah. To walk into your presence. That's it. Lift up your voice this morning. Hallelujah. Lift up your voice to the King of all kings. He's the Lord of all lords. He's God Almighty. We worship you, Jesus. We praise your name, Heavenly Father. Hallelujah. Come on, clap your hands one more time unto the Lord. Come on, shout out his praises this morning. We serve a good God. He's the Almighty God. He's the one true living God. He's in this place today. We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Three times. 
failed you? He doesn't have it within himself to fail. He cannot fail. Your friends may fail you. Even your brother may fail you. Your mom and dad may fail you. Oh, but there's a heavenly father that's never failed you. He's never going to fail you. I'm glad that I serve that kind of God that when I cry out to him and I'm standing in the need of an answer, he's there. Man, we say it all the time, but it's so true. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. You have a covenant. You have a promise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank him one more time. Thank you, Lord. Man, it's so good to be in the presence of the Lord on this Sunday morning. Amen. It, it's snowing out there, but God's raining down his glory on us today. Are you thankful for his presence? He is so good. He is so faithful. When you get your mind on him and you create an atmosphere for him to abide, he's always faithful to meet us. And he is here today. We just want to take a few moments. We want each and every one of you to just take a moment, slip out in the aisle. Let's greet one another. Amen. We're going to put this service on pause. Glory.
Praise the Lord. Let's quickly find our seats. Turn to them. I'd like our ushers to come as we were prepared to receive God's tithes and our offerings. Amen. God is good. Isn't the choir doing a fantastic job in worship, leading us into worship? Amen. We've been preparing hard for Summit. Still more to do, but we appreciate our music ministry, don't we? Amen, amen. Okay, my ushers are in place. Praise the Lord. Amen. Just a, a few announcements. Let's not forget service Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. We're continuing our revival with Brother Jones. Are you enjoying revival? <laughs> Praise the Lord. God is doing wonderful things. God is doing a work, and we are so grateful for what God is doing in this revival. Let's just keep moving on. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's not forget all church prayer Wednesday at 7 o'clock. I want to invite everybody out. If you are a guest here, we want to extend that invitation to you. It's for whosoever will. We gather together every Wednesday night for a season of prayer. And if you, uh, it's not formal, we're not dressed up in our suit and ties, but if you'd like to come and spend a season of prayer with us, please do so at 7 o'clock this Wednesday. I don't have a card in front of me, but if you're a first-time guest, hold up those guest cards. Usher's okay. If you are a guest and you didn't get one of those rectangular cards, we want you to get one during the offering. Hold on to it. And after service, after the preaching and the altar call, we want you to meet us out in the coffee shop cafe area. And uh, the coffee shop wants to treat you to a free drink, a latte, iced tea, whatever you'd like to drink. But just fill out your guest card, turn it in at the, the register, and you don't have to pay a dime. And uh, we'd love to get to know you better. If you have any questions about the church and what's going on around here, we would love to tell you about it. So please stick around, and uh, we will connect after service. All right. On Sunday mornings, just want to remind everybody, we do march row by row. So if you came prepared to give today, or if you didn't, please march with us so everybody can get out and get an opportunity to give. Amen. Let's bow our heads. We're going to pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your spirit that we have felt here thus far. We know that you're not done with the service. We ask you continue, Lord God, to touch us, Lord God. Anoint the remainder of the service, Lord Jesus. Have your way today, we pray. We ask that you would bless this offering and those that have the ability to give today as we sow back into your kingdom, that your kingdom may grow and be filled in the earth. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Everybody say amen. amen. All right, let's worship the Lord as we give today. Yeah. 
testimony, would you clap your hands this morning? Yeah. Did he heal you? Yes. Did he free you? Yes. Did he save your soul? Yes. Did he make you whole? Yes. yes. Did he wash you? Yes. Transform you? Come on, let's enter into a place of real worship this morning. Would you lift your hands all over the building? Let's praise the greatest name ever known to a mortal. There's none like you, Jesus. God, we give you high praise.
our hands all over this sanctuary today. And let's love him. this opportunity to thank each and every one of you that were here yesterday for our cleaning day and uh, man there was just such a good spirit while people were here cleaning the church and just having great fellowship I didn't do anything I didn't feel good but I was sure here morning and uh, I'm still not doing good but I told myself you are not going to keep me I don't feel good I don't feel good but I told myself I wanted to be in the presence of God today With that, with that in mind, there are so many of our brothers and sisters that are out with all kinds of stuff. I want us to continue to pray for Sister Sergeant. God would touch her. And um, let's just lift our hands and pray for our brothers and sisters. They're just all kinds of seasonal stuff that's going around. Father, by the authority of the name of Jesus, God, I pray for our dear sister sergeant. Infuse her with health and strength. And each and every one of our brothers and sisters, come on, pray with us, would you? By the authority of the name of Jesus. By the authority of the name of Jesus. I got a, I got a text from one of our dear brothers in this church. He said, Pastor, I lost my voice. And I thought, you know, the devil would probably want me to lose my voice. And I'd probably be up here with a couple symbols. I want to tell you, I feel so much victory in this. Jesus had... There is no demonic spirit anywhere around here. You're free. You're free to lift your voice. You're free to clap your hands. You're free to praise him. There ain't no devil around here today. When you, I, I just, I am just, I am just in awe. I am just in awe. And um, when you have this degree of praise and worship one of the benefits of that is is it drives back you could uh, you could be fighting the devil all week and a lot of us do and everybody does from time to time but you could you could have been fighting the devil all week and walk in here this morning and lift your hands with the force of this worship and if you want to be free, you can be free. God is not going to let any human be bound that wants to worship. The wild man of Gadara proved that. Somebody praise him. It is only a human being that chooses. 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 Wow. Just what a service. Amen in Jesus' name. Several weeks ago, this great congregation took up uh, some pledges. The church was awarded a uh, $800,000 grant from the state of Washington. That in itself is, a, is no small feat. 
and um, this this great congregation um, heartily responded. We took up pledges. This is just a reminder. If you can, sooner is better than later. I just want to get that out there because we're starting the project ASA. So by next September, we've got 10 brand new classrooms in addition to what we have. And so we would appreciate that so very, very much. Brother Jones, Brother Jones, Brother Jones, we got a thing going on. Don't we, Brother Jones? Um, I want to say, I want to say as a spokesperson, for the rest of this congregation. Brother Jones, you have been an amazing blessing. It's good to have your sister here. It's great to have your sister here. And it is great to have um, your wife here with us and your two boys. Yes. Yes. Somebody asked me, they said, Pastor, how long is this revival going to go? Until we break the back of every lion devil. Brother Jones, come and follow the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, we can do a little bit of that. Praise the Lord, everybody. How many of you are thankful to be in God's house today? Has God been good to anybody in this house? Come on, why don't you lift up your voice? If God's been good to you, if God has made a way where there seemed to be no way, why don't you lift up your voice and shout unto God? Praise the name of the Lord. God is up to something. God is up to something. Just want to quickly give honor to Pastor and Sister Mayo. We love and appreciate them, and we're thankful that God has connected us. We love their family. Love Zach and his family. The Marks and their family. We love them. Appreciate them. And uh, we give honor to this church. And um, even my kids love this church. We were sitting at dinner, and uh, my youngest son, Jaden, who some of you know who he is, <laughs> we were sitting down at the table, and I hope it's okay. I'm about to embarrass somebody right now, but hopefully she'll forgive me. We were sitting down eating dinner, and my son just looks up and says, Daddy, I said, yes, Jaden. He said, I'm in love with Jaden. And I said, and it literally took us off guard because we've never heard him say anything like that before. And we said, oh, I love Jaden. I love her so much. Well, that's not it. My son Judah apparently has a girlfriend here. And apparently Nora is Judah's girlfriend. <laughs> uh, Jaden made the statement. Uh, it was right after prayer. He told Sister Jaden over here. He said, I want you to be a part of my family. <laughs> Claim those things that are not as though they were. Praise God. So... I guess it's a good place to find love. Praise God. <laughs> My God. And so we have thoroughly enjoyed being here. And thank you for being so kind to me and my family. And uh, I know we joked around for just a little bit, but I do feel a tremendous burden here today that God has given me an assignment ever since last Sunday after we left this building. I believe God gave me a topic to preach on. And so by the help of God, I'm going to try to preach this topic with such passion and fervency in my spirit. I'm going to tell you like this. I'm going to preach like it's my last service. So that's what I feel. Why don't we lift our hands and pray one more time 
and ask God to really help us. Come on, why don't you lift up your voice? God, we need you in this house. I don't want to go another step in this service if you're not in this right now. God, I want you to anoint us. God, I want you to anoint my lips. God, I want you to anoint my mind and my spirit. God, I need you to touch my heart and my soul. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody shout amen. amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. The Bible gives a brief description of the speed of life. James 4 and 14 says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away. We use this vernacular like time is flying by. Or time is flying when you're having fun. When we reminisce on things that have happened in the past, we make the statement, I remember like it was yesterday. Life is short and it goes by quickly. I'm going to read a poem about time. When I was a child, I laughed and wept. Time crept. When I was a youth, I dreamed and talked, and time walked. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. And later, as I got older, time flew. Soon I shall find, while traveling on, time gone. Psalms 90 makes this statement, teach us to number our days to act like today is our very last one but as humanity we like to put things off till tomorrow houses all over America are full of projects that are unfinished we make the excuses we don't have time or I'll get to it eventually haven't had time to sit down and work on it or many will say, it will get done one day. I don't have time to do it. And there is a dangerous place when we have the mentality of we'll do something one day. We've all heard it. I'll eventually work out one day. I'll eventually eat better one day. But you're putting faith in something that God said was not even promised to you. Proverbs 27 and 1. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. James 4 and 14 states, we know not what tomorrow holds. But it's innate in us to put off and say we'll do it a later time. Time is ticking. Time is ticking. Time is ticking. But I'm afraid we live in a world right now that does not value time. But we waste time. Stats show how we waste our time. According to a poll taken in 2023, the average teenager spends at least four hours a day on social media. But of the age when they turn at least 17, the average goes up to at least six hours a day. It is proven, in fact, that girls spend more time on social media platform than boys. It's time that's being wasted. Now it's about to get really convicting in this room right now. The average person spends 28 to 32 hours a week on entertainment. A week. That's a part-time job. Kids are consumed by media and so are the parents. But if we're spending this much time, something is being sacrificed. 
It's an alarming poll that I'm about to bring forth to you here this morning. While 63% of Americans claim to be Christians, 11% read their Bible every day. 11%. While 56% wants to read more, but they make the excuse that I'm too busy. But it continues to decline. The average time of Christians praying per day is 18 minutes a day. What we are realizing at the beginning of this message is we are tremendously out of balance. We are wasting time on things that don't matter. March Madness will not save us. Patrick Mahomes will not save us. But the very thing that can save us, we are not making time for. Entertainment is choking us. The desires of our flesh is choking us. And what church has become is a last resort. When life gets too bad, I'll go to church. When my marriage is struggling, I'll turn to God. He has become a last resort. But we need a revival of a love for the word of God. We needed a fresh baptism of a reverence for his presence. If we're not careful, we'll only come to God when things are bad. Time, time, time. But there comes a day where time stops ticking. There comes a point in our lives where death comes and shows up. But my question to you is, when death shows up, where will you spend eternity? Time will be no more. The only thing that will matter is what you did with the time granted unto you. It is estimated that there are over 56 million deaths occurring annually, which translated to approximately 4.6 million deaths monthly, 150,000 deaths daily, 6,000 hourly, 106 every minute, and nearly two every second. Death is something we don't like to talk about. Death is something we want to not even contemplate because there's uncertainty there. But death is coming to us all. And my question is today, if death, when death comes, where will you spend eternity? Oh, Brother Jones, I just don't like this type of preaching. Just this morning, which I knew, I came to the church here about 6 o'clock in the morning trying to get ready for the service and I have my phone on what, it, what we call do not disturb. And I just happened to walk into the building and my iPad started dinging. And I looked and it's one of my friends that sent me a text message at 6 o'clock this morning. And he said, bro, with exclamation points. And I sent back, bro, with exclamation points. And he said, you'll never guess who just died. This morning. I said, who was it? It was a man that we used to work with together. Got filled with the Holy Ghost, got baptized in Jesus' name, and got addicted to drugs. Got in a halfway house. So addicted that he was willing to move from Alabama to go to a different state to live with somebody that would allow him to have the drugs that he wanted. Today, just this morning, they found him. And they believe it happened last night, late last night, and death showed up. I hope and pray to God that he found repentance. I can't put him anywhere, but I know one thing, that death is coming. Where will you spend eternally? When I receive that text message, I'm going to be completely honest with you. Death hits differently when it's somebody that you know. 
Immediately as I was sitting back there and I'm reading the text message and I said, I'm praying for your wife, I'm praying for your family during this tough time. I'll never forget that as I put my phone down from texting him, I immediately begin to think about my own life. When death shows up, you may be able to fool everybody else, but you're not going to fool God. You may present yourself in a way that seems like everything's okay, but he is the final judge. Time is ticking. Time is ticking. Funerals are hated to be attended because it makes everybody start evaluating their own life. But when death comes knocking at your door, I'm going to say it again. Where will you go? This is the problem with the message that I'm about to preach here today. Roughly a quarter of the U.S. adults, 26%, say that they don't believe in heaven or hell. 26%. 17% don't believe that there is nothing to the afterlife. That people are just going to go back like dogs and animals, back to the dust of the earth, and nothing's going to happen to their soul. I have come today to preach about a topic that is not being preached about anymore, and it's the message called hell. Go ahead and put my title up there today. I've come to preach today about hell. I've come to preach about something that is not popular anymore. You can guarantee back when I was going to camps, you can guarantee on Tuesday night the preacher was going to preach on hell. The reason why they preach on hell is because I've heard evangelists say we need to clean some stuff up first. But I've been to camps recently. I'm telling you, I haven't heard a message preached on hell in years. We better be careful. The closer we are to the coming of the Lord that we're not missing this message, a message called hell. You will either go one place or the other. You will either go to heaven or hell. There is no do-overs. Uh, there is no middle ground. It's one or the other. But I'm going to tell you how hell is being mentioned nowadays. Hell is being mentioned in conversations with no reverence. Hell is a place that shouldn't be used as a slang word, but we have made hell a joke. Statements made like this, I'll see you in hell. Songs have been written about hell. There's a particular song, and I, I remember hearing about this song, but I, I purposely pulled it up this morning, early this morning, and I wanted to hear the lyrics of the song. It's a famous group by the name of ACDC wrote a song called Highway to Hell. Highway to Hell. But as I begin to listen to this song, I begin to listen to the lyrics uh, and it begin to break my heart uh, because we have made hell uh, just a byword. Uh, we have no reverence for it, uh, but it's just something that we say and we send people there and we'll say, I'll see you there. But this is what got me this morning. This is the lyrics to the song. I'm going down. Party time. And my friends are going to be there too. I'm on a highway to hell. The world has made hell seem glamorous and fun. But there are no parties in hell. There are no games in hell. There is no good times and good feelings in hell. But we better be careful if we do, if we will allow entertainment to desensitize us to hell. We cannot be desensitized to this, but there should be a holy fear that we don't want to go there. As so I begin to listen to this song and begin to hear the lyrics, it got a little bit worse. The lyrics made this statement. Hey, mama, look at me. I'm on the, on the way to the promised land. I'm on 
my way to the promised land. I'm a part of a rock group and I made it. Mama, look at me, but I'm on the highway to hell. As I begin to watch this video of them doing this song live, I watch this people in the crowd desensitized to what is going on and what they're even saying. This is what they're doing. It's desensitized us. And Hollywood is trying to numb you to the fact that we are going to spend eternity one or two places. And I promise you, if you get in your word and you start reading it, when the Bible stops, starts describing hell, it's not a fun place. It's not a place you want your friends to go to. It's not a place that you want your worst enemy to go to. But it's a place. Void. From God. I'm going to tell you a couple of verses of how the Bible describes hell. Revelations 21 and 8 describes hell as a place where there is burning. Matthew 25 and 46 describes it as an eternal punishment. 2 Thessalonians 1 and 9 describes it as everlasting destruction. Mark 9 and 43, where the fire never goes out. This is what the Bible is talking about. It doesn't sound like a place where you're joking around and drinking, partying, having your fun. But it sounds like a place nobody wants to go to. If we're not careful, we'll never think about hell. But this is the problem. The place called hell, according to Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, it says that this place was prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't even meant for us. But the sad part about it is people will spend eternity in hell in a place that was never meant for them. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go there. And I'm living my life every day like that day's my last. Because you can play, you can have fun and do what you want to, but there's coming a day that you will stand before the judge and you will take account for what you did with your time. Can I say again? Today, hell is real. Oh, Brother Jones, I don't know if I believe it. Well, I prove it to you. The Bible says this about hell in Isaiah 5 and 14, that hell hath enlarged itself. In Matthew 7 and 13 and verse 14, Jesus said, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many be there. Go to this place of destruction. It is a real place, y'all, but God has given us a path to save us from going there. God has given us a way of escape to get out of a place that we were all destined to. But I want to preach to you about the sounds from hell. In Luke 13 and 28, it states what the sounds from hell are will sound like there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's the first sound that I want to talk about here today that will be heard in hell. It's the sounds of sorrow. I don't want to be here. I should have got my life right when I had the time. I, I should have listened to Brother Mayo when he warned me about those relationships. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost speaking to me right now. Somebody better hear me right now. As we get closer and go further in this revival, be careful of things that start showing back up from your past. I feel the Holy Ghost stopping me to tell somebody this. Because sometimes when you get on fire for God, it's going to show up like an old relationship that all of a sudden starts showing back up. Hey, buddy, where you been? Uh, you need to come back over here. So, God, somebody better.
better hear me right now. There's going to be a girl that shows up in your past that's going to say, hey, why don't we spend some time together? Because anytime you start making progress towards God, there are going to be things that show up and try to pull you back. Somebody better hear me in the Holy Ghost right now. Be careful of relationships that start popping up all of a sudden. Because the enemy doesn't want you to be on fire for God. He doesn't want you to live your life like it's your last day. He doesn't want you to, but the sound of hell is going to sound like people that are mad and upset because they made the wrong decisions. It's going to sound like agony and pain. The sounds of hell is that people will be screaming. It's in 1 Corinthians 6 and 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, but be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I know what some of you are saying. I've done that. Okay. But you got to read verse 11. You got to read verse 11. Because there is a path for some of you to get out of this. This is what verse 11 says. And such were some of you. Brother Jones, I've made a mess of my life. I've done things that I'm not proud of. Just like everybody else that's in this building. Such were some of you. But we've been washed. But we've been restored. I've come to tell somebody today that if you're going down the wrong path, all you got to do is turn and God can change you. God can save you. Such were some of us, but God got a hold of us, but God turned our lives around, but God, God can change anybody in this building today. God can turn your life around today. I'm coming to defy the lie of the enemy that's told people in this building, you'll always be addicted. Uh, you'll always have that issue. The devil is a liar because we got ex-drug addicts in this building. We got ex-alcoholics. Uh, the key word ex. Uh, the key word ex. Uh, but God got a hold of us. Uh, but God took us out. Uh, but God saved us. God can make you new today. God can save you. This is the reason why people stay away from God. This is why people stay away from churches. Sin separates you from God. Sin gets you to a place where you don't want to be near the church, where you think that's where all the perfect people go. Really? You know what's so funny about that? When people put stigmas on churches, <laughs> You know what the gym is? It's not where the people that have the best physique go. It's that the people that are fat and overweight like me, they go to the gym because they know it's a place uh, that I can go, uh, that I can get myself together. The church is the same place. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have the best background. All you got to do is say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm a wretch undone. And God says, I can do something with that. I can do something with her. I can do something with him. I can do something with that. What does the Bible say about sin? Romans 6 and 23 says this, for the wages of sin is death. James 1 and 15 says that sin brings forth death. But this is the problem. We get caught up in life, get caught up in sin, get caught up in things that we're not proud of. Get caught up doing things that we shouldn't be doing. But here's the question I got to ask. Do you want to be free? Do you want eternity with him? 
Because if you're going to have eternity with him, there's going to have to be some choices made. The Bible does give us a description of sin that it is pleasurable for a season. We can't get caught up in our sin. We can't get caught up in our lifestyles that we don't even think about God. But I said all of this to get to this point right here. There is a man in the Bible that was so caught up with his lifestyle. The man that I'm talking about here today, the Bible doesn't even give him a name. But you know what the Bible calls him? The rich man. The rich man. Luke 16 and 19 says this. There was a certain rich man who was, who was closed clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. He was known by what he possessed and what he wore. His identity was tied to the things of this world, the things that would give him false hope of security and peace. Purple and fine linen is what princes would wear and the Bible says he fared sumptuously. That means everything that he had made him happy. Life can bring you a false security of hope and happiness. But let me ask you a question. What happens when this life is over? What happens? Because you can't take your money with you. You can't take your clothes with you. You know what I used to think when I used to hear people talk about hell? I say, you know what? I'll live the way I want to, and then when God comes back, I'll just grab my mama's skirt. Because I didn't want to think about eternity. I'll never forget times I would wake up and I'd hear the train go by. And I would jump up out of my seat, jump up out of my couch, and I'd look to see if mama was still here. Because if mama was still here, God ain't came back yet. I'd run to the bedroom and see, and mama's still in the bed. Oh, we're good. I'm afraid if we're not careful, there is no fear anymore. There is no reverence anymore. But in Luke chapter 16, there are two men that are talked about in this story. One man is the rich man, but the other man, his name is Lazarus, who was a beggar. He was just hungry for the crumbs that fell from the table. Two different lifestyles, two different circumstances, one rich and one poor. Both of these men have the same fate, death. Luke 16 and 22, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom the rich man also died and was buried. Notice at the end of that verse, the rich man also died and was buried. The beggar was carried by the angels, but the rich man was buried. He had a funeral. The, the man, the beggar didn't have enough money to have a funeral. But the rich man had enough money to have his own funeral. But the question is, where do you go after this life is over? What happens to you? But Jesus uses this parable to focus on the most important thing. Where these men are going. Huh. Can you just imagine being a rich man, not needing for anything, not wanting for anything, having everything that you needed in life, and then all of a sudden you die? The Bible starts describing what this rich man who has no name, what he starts dealing with in hell. The Bible says that he looks up in verse 23, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosom. That word torments means severe pain and torture. He had never felt anything like this. 
He had the joys of, and the pleasures of life. He's never felt pain like this. Imagine being the rich man that never wanted for anything. But look what happens. And I'm talking here today about the sounds from hell. Verse 24 of Luke 16, I want you to put it on the screen. And he cried. You know what's going to be in hell? People crying for a second chance. That word cry means to call, to summon, to cry out, to shout, to yell. It's the sounds from hell. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy. You know what that cry is going to sound like from hell? It's going to be a cry for mercy. God, give me mercy. God, give me one more service. God, give me one more summit conference. God, give me one more Tuesday night. But there's going to be a cry. There's going to be a cry from hell. But it's not going to sound like anything we've ever heard before. I've heard the agonizing cries of my wife as she's getting ready to deliver a baby. And the pain, the pain that they deal with, but it's going to be on a whole nother level. I heard the cries of my boys when they've been hurt. They've hurt something on their body. They got a gash in their lip. They've, they've cut their forehead. And I've heard the cries of my son. But I'm telling you, the sounds from hell are going to be a lot worse than anything that we've ever heard. It's going to be a screeching yell saying, God, give me one more time. God, give me one more time. God, please. But this is the problem. Lazarus. Is sitting next to Father Abraham. The beggar! Abraham's bosom. He's enjoying paradise. He's enjoying the place that the rich man wanted to go. You know, he starts asking, have mercy. My question to you is, how many times has mercy reached for you and you haven't reached back? But I'm telling you, we're living in an age where we're spitting on mercy. Mercy is renewing every morning. Mercy reaches for us every day. But there is coming a day where mercy will stretch back its hand and say, I waited 120 years. I gave you plenty of days. I gave you a space of grace. But you wouldn't respond. The Bible says, while God waited, while the long suffering of God waited, people didn't stretch back. But the problem is, I'm afraid that people are going to reach for mercy when mercy is no longer reaching. Time is ticking. Time is ticking. Oh, Brother Jones, you're just trying to scare me. If you've got that mindset, you're going to miss this whole sermon right there. You're just trying to scare me. But there is a good, healthy fear that we need to have. I don't want to go to hell. And when we have a fear, a good, healthy fear of hell, we'll be willing to do whatever it takes not to go there. I'm telling you, I've come with a mandate from God to preach it as strong as I can. Hell is real. Hell is real. Hell is a real place. But it's up to you where you go. God doesn't want you to go to hell, but he wants to lead you back to repentance. The Bible says it is his kindness that draws us to repentance. The sounds of hell. Being in torments, he cries out for mercy. But I'm afraid that we got people in this building that haven't cried this whole revival. That you will cry one day. And I know some of you think that I'm trying to be a little bit more, I promise I'm not. But we better be careful when we cannot be moved by the Spirit of God. We better be careful when we can't be moved and nothing stirs us anymore. Which shows me that we're being desensitized. And that desensitization is coming from entertainment. 
It's coming from music. Ah, man, I, I, I can't get off the music thing here. It's coming from things that don't even scare us anymore. I remember when I was your age, when somebody preached on hell, you could guarantee it. Every young person would be in the altar. But now we've got movies that talk about another world that has desensitized us. There, there is no fear. I've heard people say, a loving God would never send us to hell. He doesn't send you. You choose. I'm trying to help somebody because I've had a burden since last Sunday. God doesn't want to send you there. You choose. His mercy is reaching for you today, but it's a choice. It's his love that gives you the power of choice. You choose. The sounds of hell. Ah! I pray that you go home and you can't shake this message. I pray that you go home and that God gives you a dream of hell. Oh, yeah, yep, yep. Yeah. Because when you have a dream of hell, something starts stirring you. You can't walk the same. You can't talk the same. You can't act the same. Something gets a hold of you and says, I don't want to go there. I'm about to embarrass somebody right now. They're not here, but somebody told me a statement. The backslider, they may be watching, I love you. Backslider made the statement that they were flying on an airplane and that turbulence started hitting the airplane. And immediately what the backslider said, I'm telling you verbatim what the backslider said, that when the turbulence started hitting, I started praying. Because that fear showed up. That if this plane goes down, I don't know where I'm going. What kind of life is that? Somebody hear me right now. What kind of life is that? That you want to repent when something goes bad. Just in case. Just in case. I've heard people on their deathbed started realizing, I may not be ready. And they started calling people and apologizing and asking, asking them to forgive. Because death has something that gets our attention that says, I got to be ready. I've heard stories of backsliders on their deathbed of a man. And I'm, I'm telling you right now, in the fear of God, I'm trying to help somebody. I've heard of backsliders on their deathbed that literally made the statement to their kids, I can feel the flames. I can feel the flames. I can feel the heat coming from my toes and it's going up to my legs. I, I, maybe there was something to that apostolic stuff. Maybe there was something to the Pentecostal stuff. On their deathbed. They're saying, I can feel the flames. I can feel it. I, I, I shouldn't have took it for granted. I shouldn't have told them they were crazy. Sounds of hell. Sounds like a lot of people in regret. The sounds that come from hell is a lot of people that wish they could do it all over. But listen to this, Luke 16, verse 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water. Hold on, y'all. Just a little, just a little drop. Just a little drop because I'm tormented here. Just, I don't need the whole bottle. Just give me a little drop in order to just give me a little peace. The sounds of hell sounds like people that will take just a little bit of something to get away from the torment of the flames, to get away from the torment, but there is no going back. I've heard stories of people that have so-called went to hell and have come back. No. And they tell stories of, oh, it, was, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. I actually came back and now I'm an atheist because it's just not that bad. Because the enemy knows if I can desensitize humanity to a place called hell, They can live the way they want to live. They can do what they want to do. And there is no 
consequences. Because God is love. I feel this right now in the Holy Ghost right now. I feel a spirit in this area that's telling people, God is love. Do what you want to. It's a lot. Somebody better hear me right now. God has brought some people in this building right now to hear what I'm preaching right now. Yes, God is love, but he's also a God of judgment. He does love you. But you can't live the way you want to live. You can't live just doing what appeased your flesh. And this rich man did whatever he wanted to do. Have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me. Maybe this is the first time the rich man cried when his tears didn't make a difference at this point. All he wanted was a little reprieve. And while the beggar is sitting up comforted, Luke 16 and 25, but Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And besides all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. He knew what was going on. Abraham was trying to tell him, there's a great gulf fixed, which means you may be able to see me, but I can't come to you. I can't come rescue you. Young people, your parents can't save you from hell when you're already there. Give me one more service. Cries of hell. It's the sounds of hell. I can't come, rich man. And then I can see as the rich man starts realizing that I'm just going to be here. Where does he turn to next? Put verse 27 up there. You know what's going to be in, in hell? Not only is it going to be a cry for mercy, but it's going to be a sound of prayer in hell. People praying, God, give me one more service. People that wouldn't pray while they were on earth, but now have found time to pray. I'm too busy, but Jones, I can't pray. I promise you there's coming a day that you will pray. And sometimes that prayer will be a cry. God, save me from here. But where does he turn his attention to? Huh. Remember that this man was a rich man that now in hell has turned into a beggar. He's begging God. He's begging Abraham, get me out. But he goes from a rich man to a beggar to a preacher. He goes from a rich man to a beggar to a preacher. What does he preach? We're about to find out. I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. In hell, he learns to pray but he has a message. Next verse. Go tell my family this isn't a joke. Go tell my brothers lest they come to the place of torment. The rich man turns into a beggar and then he becomes an evangelist. Don't send him here. If we could have a preacher here tonight, I would bring this preacher, the rich man, up here. And I promise you he'd preach with everything that's within him for one service to save one person from this place. That's why I felt a burden since last Sunday. This could be somebody's last service. This could be. You could be face to face with eternity when you leave this building. If this was your last service, see, 
I'm going to lose some of you right here. I'm going to lose some of you right here because some of you are going to say, oh, that's not going to happen. You're just trying to scare me. If you knew that this was your last service, how would you act? I guarantee you we wouldn't have enough room to baptize all the people. Because there's a little bit of uncertainty if we're, if we're honest. There's a little bit, I just don't know. I, I know that's what my grandparents taught me. That's what my daddy taught me. But there's just something missing. This preacher, he turns from a rich man to a beggar. He starts pleading. Go tell my brothers. There's a message from hell that is coming to 2024. That is making this statement, hell is real. Hell is a real place. Well, what happens? Send Lazarus. Send somebody. Send a messenger. And this is what Abraham responds. Nope, I can't do it. If they won't hear the prophets that they have right now, it doesn't matter if I raise you from the dead. So you know what's happening right now? And I'm telling you, we're living in there right now. Right now. Because we have a hearing problem. But I pray that you hear this message. Hear the cry from a man who has went to hell. And he's trying to warn people, you don't have to go there. I preached about hell just recently. Went to Tennessee. I preached. I preached it as strong as I could, Pastor May. I preached as strong as I could. And I knew there was people there that were being convicted by the Spirit. I'll never forget, my, my wife was there, my sister was there. I get done preaching. Nobody comes to the altar. Hardly anybody comes to the altar. I watched as people that were, had tears in their eyes just walked out of the building. And literally, as I get done preaching, I sit on the altar and I am vexed in my spirit. We went out to eat afterwards. Everybody, and my wife will attest to this. We went to eat afterwards. Everybody was trying to talk. I couldn't talk. And I told my wife later, how can we just pass by this service? We're preaching about eternity and people just leave the church like they're okay. Not moved, not stirred, nothing wanting to change. I watched people just walk out. At altar call time, the time where you can get right with God. I watched people literally walk out. And I sat in that restaurant and I literally said maybe five words. I couldn't talk. I left early. I got up. I said, we need to go. And I was literally sitting in the recliner when we got back to the Airbnb. And I just said, God, are we really that desensitized? Are we really to the place that hell doesn't move us anymore? I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in this building. People are going to write this service off. But you know what? There's coming a day where you're not going to be able to tell God you didn't know. You're not going to be able to say, God, I didn't know. No. God, maybe for the very first time, you're hearing a message like this. And I told the pastor later, I said, I apologize if I was short. I just cannot get happy. When we preach about eternity and people don't move. I can't get happy. I just can't go to a restaurant and just act like everything's okay. But let me tell you what else is going to be in hell. It's going to be a sound of repentance. God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry. God, I, I, I should have listened when I had the time. God, I, I don't want to be here. There is no fun in hell. There is no good times in hell. But this is the most haunting thing about hell. I want you to put that verse back up there about the brothers. 
Would you put it back up there? The rich man knew about his brothers. Which means to tell me, the one thing that scares me the most about hell is you will not lose your memory. Go back and tell my brothers. Do you literally know what that means? That means you will remember every service that you skipped out on. Every altar call that God pulled you and you didn't respond because I just don't like those people there. Every service that you could have got right with God that you said, I'll do it next Sunday. I'll do it Tuesday. I'll do it another day. You will never forget. I had this young man. Oh God, I pray if he watches this that it turns something in his spirit. He got addicted to smoking weed. And he got supplied some weed that was laced. It messed him up. Somebody better hear me right now. It was laced weed. It was so bad to the point that it made him start hallucinating. And this is what he told me. You would think after an experience like this that you'd be willing to live for God with 110%. We had a quiz tournament going on at the church at the time. He said, I'm telling you, Carrie, it's like a God experience that he gave me that as I'm hallucinating, I don't know where I am. All I could hear was your voice. He said, I was literally doing things like this. No, 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 I don't want to hear it. As I go to the hospital to visit him and this other young man, all they could say is, all I could hear was sermons that you and pastor preached. This isn't a game, y'all. This isn't a game. And you know what's gonna happen? Brother Jordan, come help me. I'm almost done. In hell, you're gonna remember messages that this man preached. In hell, You're going to hear the agonizing screams of people that have been praying for you that you have not responded to. I'm afraid that we're going to wait. Some of us are going to wait till it's too late to finally get right with God. You know when they decided to get right with God in Noah's day? They didn't realize what was going on. The Bible says until the day when it was too late I hope some of you young people get a healthy fear of hell today because you know what it'll do when you go to school you won't laugh at the dirty jokes it will cause you to walk different you may get fun of get made fun of but I'm living my life to not go to hell let them make fun of you if they want to Let them do it. But as long as heaven is where I stay for eternity, it was worth it. It was worth all the jokes where you said you're super spiritual and you never do anything fun. Say all you want to. But if I walk on streets of gold, if I walk on streets of gold and I make heaven my home, it was worth every joke. It was worth everything that I abstained from because I want to make heaven my home. It was worth it. There'll be no tears there. 
There'll be no crying there. There'll be joy. I'm reaching for every person in this building right now. I'm reaching for people that have been in church all your life. And I'm reaching for the visitor. I'm reaching for people right now that you're not sure where you're going. If God was to come back right now, I'm reaching for every one of you. But God would not allow me to preach this message without giving you the option of finding the path I feel opposition right now. This isn't something to play with right now. Some of you have been distracted this whole service. Because the enemy doesn't want you to hear what I've been preaching. Eternity's real. But there is a way out. Brother Jones, what is that way? I don't want to lose nobody right here. If this, this is the most important part of the service. You want a way out? God's about to show you the way out. John chapter 3, I want you to put it on the screen. I'm going to tell you the way out. John chapter 3 and verse 2. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. He's talking about the miraculous. And where does God take him? Put verse 3 up there. Jesus answered and said unto Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. He doesn't even answer his question. He's not worried about the miraculous. He's worried about the soul. Verse 4, put it up there. I'm doing this for every person in this building right now. And don't tune me out if you've heard this before. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter to do the second time into his mother's womb? He's trying to figure this out in his human way of thinking. I'm an old man. How can I go back into my mother's womb? I, I, this doesn't make sense. Next verse, verse five. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. First he said, see. Then he says in verse five, you cannot enter. We got a lot of people think they're going somewhere where they're not. What does the word say? You've got to be born again of the water. Now listen, everybody, class participation right here. What's the water? Thank you so much. What's the spirit? The Holy Ghost. If you don't have that, you cannot enter. Point blank, period. You cannot, but you must be. You must be. How can you enter into a kingdom that you were not born into? Hell is real. We got a lot, man. I'm just going to say it like it is. I just feel to say this, and I'm coming against the spirit of this city right now, that you cannot just accept the Lord as your personal Savior and live. Oh, I feel it. Listen, if you have done that, that's a good step. And, and somebody may say, well, Brother Jones, I felt good after I did it. Anytime you step out in faith, God will meet you. But that doesn't mean that's the end of it. The Bible says that the devils believe and tremble. So I guess all the devils are going to heaven? No! It's not enough. Believing is the first step. But you got to be born again of the water and of the Spirit. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Now notice in Acts 2 and verse 38. 
There is no question mark if you want to, if you feel like it. No, you must be. Acts 4 and verse 12. Whatever you do in word or in deed, you must do it all in the name of Jesus. Because all power was given to him in heaven and in earth. Brother Jones, I've already been baptized. Question is, how were you baptized? Does it really matter? Yeah, it matters. I'm coming against a spirit and a stronghold in this area. I can feel it right now. It's a stronghold that's trying to convince people that you're saved. But you haven't been saved by the biblical way. You know what happened? After Peter started preaching in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, and they were pricked in their hearts. The purpose of preaching is supposed to prick something in you that you ask the question, what must we do? What must we do to be saved? But we're living in a world that everybody's saved. So the word is not pricking our hearts anymore. It's making us feel good. I'm good. I accepted the Lord. I'm praying somebody hears me right now. If there is a little bit of hesitancy in your spirit right now of where you're going, I would do whatever it took to make sure today that I was right with God. Whatever it took. If it means being rebaptized, you don't remember how you were baptized, and it's saying, I, I just want to make sure that I'm ready, I'd be willing to do it. Whatever it takes. Let's stand all over this house. I'm ending with this story right here. You got to be born again of the water and the spirit. If you don't do that, you cannot enter into the kingdom. I want everybody to listen to what the story I'm about to tell right now. There was a man by the name of Charlie Peace. He was a criminal. Laws of God or man curbed him not. Finally, the law caught up with him and he was condemned to death. On the fatal morning in jail, Leeds, England, he was taking, taken on the death walk. Before him went the prison chaplain, routinely and sleepily reading some Bible verses. The criminal touched the preacher and asked him what he was reading. The consolations of religion was the reply. Charlie Peace was shocked at the way he professionally read about hell. <laughs> a criminal is shocked that a preacher is just haphazardly talking about hell. <gasps> it's a place of utter darkness. <sighs> it's a place of destruction. And something grabs a hold of Charlie Pierce as he hears this preaching. <laughs> Could a man be so unmoved under the very shadow of the scalpel as to lead a fellow human there and yet dry-eyed, red of a pit that has no bottom into which this fellow must fall? Could this preacher believe the words that there is an eternal fire that never consumes its victims and yet slide over the phrase without a tremor. Is a man human at all who can say with no tears, you will be eternally dying and yet never know the relief that death brings? All this was too much for a man that was a criminal. It was too much to hear about this place called hell. And he gives this preacher this response. Sir, 
addressing the preacher. If I believed what you and the church of God say that you believe, even in England, we're covered with broken glass from coast to coast. I would walk over it if need be on my hands and on my knees if it meant saving one person from this place you have just described. I will crawl all over England that is shattered with broken glass. I'll cut myself in order to save one person from this place that you described. Just one person. That's what God is trying to do today. He's trying to save one person. He wants to save all of us. But if it means just saving one person, my job is done. I'm going to say it again. Hell is real. But I pray that you hear the words of this preacher. If you have a little bit of hesitancy in your spirit right now, I'd do whatever it took. I wouldn't care what nobody in this church thought about me. Because if we do not make things right today, you will remember this sermon in hell. the words ah! you will hear the scream do something about it today do something about it today come on sir do something about it today come on ma'am do something about it today but I have preached this sermon I've went a long time I've preached this sermon for this moment right here right now some of you are feeling the conviction right now. Oh, but Jones, I just don't believe that. Okay. 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 Don't be like the rich man that had everything perfect and everything good and nothing could move him. Every eye closed. If you're on the ministry team, you can look, but other than that, no, nobody else looking in this building. This is a very serious moment here today. Very serious moment here today. If you're in this building, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you've been here 50 years. I don't care. I don't care if you've been living for God all your life. And something has been convicting you this whole service. There's a little bit of uncertainty. Maybe you just don't remember how you were baptized. You don't remember what the preacher spoke over, to you, over you when you went down in the water in the name of Jesus. Maybe it was in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And you say, Brother Jones, I just want to make sure that I'm ready. I just want you to lift your hand right now. Nobody's looking. I want you to lift your hand. Come on. I want you to lift your hand. Lift it high. Lift it high. Lift it high. It must start tired. I want you to put your hands down. I want everybody to look at me. I'm about to call this altar call. I'm not trying to make nobody do what I want to. I just watched some of you. Half of the people in this building did not raise their hand. Half of the people did not raise their hand. If you're good, I'm glad you're good. But there's some people I feel mercy reaching down your road today. That's saying, don't miss the mercy. Because if you won't cry today, there's coming a day that you will cry. If you won't pray today, there's coming a day that you will pray. And if you don't reach for mercy, there is a day that you will reach for mercy. All right, I'm done. If you're in this building and you feel like, you know what? No, no, no. We're not doing that. I want every person in this building to come to this altar right now. I don't want to give the devil any room today. No, don't, don't bow your face. I want you to stand up. I want you to stand. 
I want every person, every person, come to this altar right now. This is beautiful right here. This is beautiful. I want everybody to hear me. I want everybody to hear me. I want everybody to listen to me. Hell is real. It wasn't meant for you. So this is what I'm going to do. If you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of all your sins, we have robes. We've got water. We've got the ability to get it done today. You won't even have to get your clothes wet. I know some of us think, you know, I just don't want to get my clothes wet. You don't have to. So I'm giving every excuse that you have not to get right with God today. We're throwing it out the window. I know some of you saying it's, it's almost like I'm trying to push. I want you to make sure today. I have felt the urgency of this sermon last Sunday. Which means to tell me, God knows. God knows. This could be your last service. If this was your last service, how would you approach this altar call? If you knew, I promise you, i am tell you what would happen. I wouldn't have had to call an altar call. People would have started running. So it's up to you now. It's up to you now. I don't care how old you are. If you have a little bit of hesitancy, I would say, God, all right, I don't want to go to hell. So what we're going to do is we're all about to repent right now. Every person, we're all about to repent right now. We're about to ask God to cleanse us right now. Now I want you to just lift your hands and repent right now. God, here we are today. God, I've messed up and I've made mistakes. But God, I want to be clean and I want to be ready. I don't want to go to hell. I want to make heaven my home. Come on, pray like a desperate person right now. Come on, pray like a desperate person right now. Come on, pray like this is your last service. Come on, pray like this could be your last altar call. Because if you will not cry out today, there will be a day you will cry out. (laughs) God, forgive me. Wash me. Renew a right spirit within me, oh God. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord. But I want you in my life. God, I surrender my heart to you. God, I surrender my spirit to you. I'm not coming to this altar with preconceived ideas. But God, I want you. God, if I need to be baptized, I want you to deal with them about baptism today. God, if they need the Holy Ghost, I pray that you deal with them about the Holy Ghost. But I don't want to be lost. All right, all right, this is what we're about to do. We're about to pray. And we're going to leave the option up to, we're not going to force anybody to do something they don't want to do. We're not going to do it. That's not the church, this, this is not that type of church. But can I do this real quick? I need one lady that can help with baptisms. Will you raise your hand? Okay. Come here, come up here. I need one man that can help with baptisms. Raise your hand. Raise your hands. One man. Just one man. Did I miss it? Okay. Come up here. You just stand right there. You stand right there. This is what we're going to do. We're going to enter into a prayer meeting. We're just going to pray. And I don't care who you are in this building. If you realize I may not have been baptized correctly, I may have been baptized in the Father, Son, and Holy. In Acts chapter 19, they had to be rebaptized. 
in the name of the Lord Jesus. So if you are baptized in the titles Father, Son, Holy Ghost, you have to be rebaptized in the name of Jesus. There's only one baptism. There's only one way. One. It's not your way, my way, and the highway. No. It's God's way. So we're about to pray. And this is what we're going to do. If you need to be baptized, when we start praying, I want you to get his attention. If you're a man. If you're a woman and you need to be baptized, I want you to get her attention. And church, this is a time for us to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost. Because there are people in this altar that need this. That desperately need this. So are you ready? If this message was not for you, go find somebody to pray with. Hell hath enlarged itself. But I'm praying today that God would reach where hell is trying to get some of us and pull us out through the power of his mercy. It's here right now. It's here right now. So this is what we're going to do. We're not going to look around. But when God's, I'm telling a man in this building right now, you better hear me. When God starts dealing with you about baptism, when he starts dealing with you about it, don't fight it. You get his attention, say, show me how to get to the water. Show me how to get to the water because I'm ready. Let's lift our hands and pray. Let's lift our hands. Come on, church. Come on, church. Help me pray. Come on, church. Help me pray. Come on, church. Help me pray right now. Come on, church. Help me pray. Come on, we got one already saying, I'm ready to get baptized. Come on, pray, church. Come on, pray, church. Because if you will not cry out today, you will cry out one day. I've got to be right. I've got to be ready. I've got to be ready. I've got to be ready. Come on, church, pray. 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 Come on, church, we're not looking around to see who walks on the platform. We're praying right now. We're praying right now. We're praying right now. Come on. We're praying, God, help us. We're praying, God, forgive us. We're praying, God, lead us. Come on, that doesn't sound like a desperate person. Come on, that doesn't sound like a desperate person. Come on, it's a cry. It's a cry. Come on, it's a cry. It's something that comes deep down out of your belly. It comes deep down out of your guts that say, God, I want to be saved. I want to be saved. I want to be saved. Come on, church, we got to pray. There are people in this building that's seeking what we've been preaching about right now. Come on, there's people in this building seeking what we've been preaching about today. Come on, God, I want to be ready. We got people about to get baptized, but there's more people in this building. Come on, we want to make sure everybody's right. We want to make sure everybody's right. We want to make sure everybody is right. Come on, ma'am, do what you feel right now. I'm talking to a lady right now in this building that you can feel the conviction of God. Do what you feel right now. Don't be afraid. We come against the spirit of fear right now in the name of Jesus Christ. God, I want you. God, I want you in my life. This is not just a feel-good altar call, but this is an altar call of change. This is an altar call where something shifts. This is an altar call where I'm going to live different. This is an altar call that I'm going to live like today's my last day. This is an altar call. Come on, keep praying. Come on, keep praying. Come on, keep praying. Come on, keep praying. 
We come against the spirit of fear. Come on, church, we got to keep praying. We come against the spirit of fear right now in the name of Jesus. We come against the spirit of intimidation. We come against doctrines of devils. We come, oh, we come against it right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Save us. Come on, somebody reach for mercy. Come on, somebody reach for mercy. Come on, somebody reach for mercy. Come on, come on, something's happening right now. God's dealing with some hearts right now. I'm telling you, God's dealing with some hearts right now. I'm telling you, God is dealing with some hearts right now. God is dealing with some hearts. Right some hearts. That's conviction that you're feeling, ma'am. That's conviction that you're feeling, sir. All you got to do is respond to it. All you got to say is, God, here I am. God, here's my heart. God, here's my spirit. Come on, pray. Come on, pray. Come on, pray. Hallelujah. 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 I love you, Jesus. Come on. It's in this atmosphere. Somebody can receive the Holy Ghost. Come on. I want you to find somebody to pray with right now. I want you to find somebody to pray with, and I want you to pray as loud as you can. I want you to pray as fervent as you can. Come on. It's your prayers that can change something for somebody else. It's your prayers that can unlock something for somebody else. We're going to pray together. We're going to pray together. We're going to pray together. God, I love you, Jesus. God, I surrender myself to you. I surrender my spirit to you. I surrender my heart. Come on, that's it, church. Get engaged in what's happening all over this altar. Come on, church, get engaged in what's happening all over this altar. God, I want you. God, I want you. God, I want you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here I am. Come on, what you're feeling right now, sis, uh, is you're feeling God's spirit right now. Those tears that are wanting to flow out of your eyes, uh, that's the Holy Ghost that you're feeling. That's the comforter that wants to come in. Uh, that's the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Here I am. Come on, yeah, yeah, pray. Come on, pray. Come on, pray. With no preconceived ideas, I'm laying it all on an altar today. With no preconceived ideas, I want to make heaven my home. God, I want to follow your word. Whatever your word says, that's what I'm going to follow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 